Welcome to the Practical 365 podcast. On the show today, I'm joined by Joanne Klein. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show today. So you are a very, very well-known Microsoft MVP, uh, especially in the compliance space as well. But for those that don't know you, uh, well, do you want to give people a bit of a, an overview of what you do and why you're a Microsoft MVP? For sure. I am an MVP in Office Apps and Services. My specialty within there is advanced compliance. So I am um, an independent consultant. I work with customers in that area of uh, Microsoft 365. And I'm also currently a consultant with Microsoft. So I'm getting lots of experience seeing all kinds of scenarios and industries and customers and problems that they have in the compliance area. So it's a real uh, challenging time right now it, it is one of those me. things that you, the more you get into it the more interesting it becomes because it can seem a little bit of a yeah it can seem like teams meeting rooms and all that sort of thing can seem quite interesting uh, actually i think last time we met we were, yeah. we, were st we were both standing demoing teams equipment weren't we yeah oh, that's right <laughs> uh, yeah but the, uh even uh, consultants I work with our adoption and change management people, they're finding that the people aspect of this is really interesting as well. Uh, but oh, the, yeah. the, the sort of number one question I think people might have is, what, what do we mean, mean when we're talking about compliance in Microsoft 365? Um, I mean, compliance means kind of different things to different organizations, but um, broad, in broad terms, it is... Um, being able to adhere to the regulations, bylaws, obligations an organization has. And of course, that varies um, dramatically from one organization, one industry to another, sometimes one country to another. Um, so organizations need to understand where they fit in that broad scheme. Yeah. And then, um, okay, what, what are we going to implement to be able to adhere to all of these regulations? So compliance is a very broad area. Um, in the industry and with even within Microsoft 365, it is comprised of a lot of different yeah. products. Uh, and what one mm -hmm. thing I see quite often is this is our, the the tools that you get in the suite. Uh, not to sort of oversell E5 or anything like that, but people get a lot of these extra tools, mm -hmm. and this almost becomes a a reset button. But compared to to what they might have had before, uh, especially with where data locations changing, all, all sorts of things, new technologies. Mm. So th there's often a phase where they need to try and build some sort of strategy for how they do this. So if you're if you're in IT and you're tasked with this, where do you start to try and build out that strategy? Who should you be talking to? It's it can be very overwhelming. So the key um, areas of an organization that are um, need to be involved with those IT teams are groups that are generally considered in the compliance area. That would be privacy, risk, um, legal. So usually those groups are very um, aware and knowledgeable about the regulation and legal aspect of the data that that organization might have. So they're coming at it from that angle. IT is coming at it in they are understanding the technical controls usually um, on, okay, this is what we can configure in our environment. So there has to be a meeting in the middle, if you will, between these two groups, which is quite often a gap I see in lots of organizations in those two areas coming together because neither of them can do it alone. It, it's basically a partnership between them, complicated by the fact like you said earlier on, is all of these different um, collaboration experiences, the data landscaping. Data landscape is getting more complicated by the day, not simpler. So all of this stuff combined together makes it a pretty challenging um, problem for organizations. So usually those compliance teams start by or should start by having basically a compliance strategy or yeah. program um, to execute all of these different pieces uh, within. So uh, when I've worked with regulated customers, then I always see that they're quite hot on this. They will have 
They, they will have mm. people who really understand the risk. They will have compliance teams that they work quite closely with. Uh, but mm-hmm. there's, there's other industries, and uh, they, they do hold a, a lot of sensitive data for people. They'll be affected by, for example, in Europe, uh, GDPR, for example. Uh, yeah. And yeah. They, they, they perhaps don't have a, an appreciation maybe in the business why this matters but they might know well you know we, we deal with a lot of sensitive customer information we know things are, are changing mm-hmm. uh, how do you convince the business when they don't have this this framework in place that compliance is something that should be important well i mean you don't have to look too far in the media today to see what happens regulated or not what happens if sensitive data uh, mm. is leaked. Um, it, it is the cost of doing business today, is making sure you understand the particularly the sensitive data that you have, and then how are we going to protect it and um, get rid of it when we are um, allowed yeah. to do so. So you think of um, freedom of information requests or um, data privacy requests, all of these things coming into companies that you, whether you're regulated or not, you need to have controls in place to to manage this at scale across your environment. So some organizations just don't have that mindset yet, or they might have it, but it's such a monumental undertaking. Where do we even begin? But, you know, you chip away at the problem. I know um, there's some recommendations we do. Uh, or I do for companies just starting, so you know have some place to kind of begin. Um, but it's yeah, it's like I said, the cost of doing business these days, and uh, whether you use automated tools to do it or do it the old-fashioned way by trying to get ahead of it manually, uh, which is going to be harder and harder as time goes on. Um, it's it's something that every company has to wrangle with at some point. And that becomes quite apparent when there has been something that's happened to the organization. So data loss, that then the checkbook yes. comes out, right? Uh, Absolutely, yeah. So compliance, I hear this all the time, compliance isn't cheap. If, if you extend that to the cost of licensing, let's say, um, in the Microsoft world, which is where I work, um, for sure it isn't. But I would argue the flip side of that is not being compliant is not cheap either. And as a matter of fact, in some examples, it might even be more expensive, depending on the, the size and nature of the data breach. And it can be, you know, um, a financial penalty. It can be loss of reputation for a business, which can be devastating. Yeah. And, uh, and another aspect yeah. I've seen, I don't, I don't know whether this is something you've seen as well, is the time and effort it can take to, to manage this, that other things that have came along. For example, uh, I had a customer who, uh, for some reason, they started getting an increasing number of subject access requests, and they they were still mm-hmm. tied to an old process where they'd print everything out, send it to a regional office. Yes. Then somebody would, someone was doing a blind call rediscovery search, basically, printing it out, sending it off to an office. Mm-hmm. That then was looked through, and then that was sent to legal. They then looked through it again, scanned it in, and then redacted it manually in, in a, Adobe Acrobat. And it was taking this, this uh, lady I was working with, she said, it's taking me about 84 hours on average per request. And I think that, that was something that, yeah. that stood out to them. They had a case for it. But it's anticipating, how do you get ahead yeah. of that game? Uh, well, I think what um, I know what Microsoft does is they try to give some tangible examples like what, what you just said. I mean, it's it's just black and white numbers when you can boil it down to how long does it take uh, one person to fulfill this data subject request? Um, and how many of those are you um, getting at any point in time, which that that volume is increasing uh, over time for sure. So, I mean, it's pretty easy to do the math at, after a while it's like well we we can't do it is not feasible to do this manually anymore we need to put in some more um, automation in order to get ahead of this you pay in one way you either pay in human resources to do it or you pay in a tool to be able to help you 
automate even some of that process. And, and where do you go then when, when you've perhaps looked at this and, and thought, I could really meet the organization's needs, but I've only got perhaps Microsoft 365 or Office 365 E3 licenses. Uh, I've not got I've not got the, ad, the advanced compliance or E5 add-ons. How do you sort of balance those two mm -hmm. requests where you bought the subscription has been bought now, the requirements sort of came a little bit later? Mm. Uh, well, I'm not going to candy coat my answer. It will be very hard to balance that, to be honest with you. Um, additional advanced licensing equals automation. So if um, if you don't have that advanced license or that extra product, which you also pay for to do it, then there's really no magic behind the scenes. You have to put in the uh, human controls and the, and the processes in order to compensate for what you aren't automating. So there's no kind of happy path to the end of that story um, if you don't have some tooling in place to help automate some of those processes. Uh, I, I, what, what would you say about perhaps trying to get as much value from the base stuff first and then build, build your business case as you go along to prove that you need the extra? Absolutely. Yes, I, I that that is the pragmatic approach, and I think that's that's sound for sure. Um, I usually come into the organization's picture when once they've gone through mm. that. But many are moving from E3, and you might decide, oh, um, this has worked well for us up to this point in time, but we would like to have a little bit more automation on this one piece of it, and then you can kind of pick and choose what's important to you as an organization. Crawl, walk, run fits into yes. that perfectly. That's something I hear um, quite a lot. Crawl might be E3, mm. right? Yeah, and just kind of build on it over so, time. So uh, yeah. there's, there's, there's a, a much more sort of in-depth um, session coming up uh, with a tech talk that you're doing. Do you want to tell us a, a little bit more about that? Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, it was a, a really good tech talk to put together and an accompanying blog post. I come from the SharePoint world. That's where when I entered um, Microsoft space. So SharePoint is near and dear to my heart. And I've seen a transformation over the years. Um, and it's ironic that I now focus on compliance because I'm always looking for ways for those two worlds to meet. And there, there's lots of overlap and things that information architects um, need, from the SharePoint world really need to understand about the compliance area, what you can and can't do with those different levels of licensing you were talking about. Um, and some of the new features that are coming, um, specifically in SharePoint, that have that tie-in back to compliance. So I like to say there should be a new or renewed, if you had it, kind of uh, working relationship between the SharePoint information architects and the information management compliance teams to see where you can uh, kind of make those two worlds meet in the middle. Well. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. Well, I think about. we're all going to be looking forward to that. So the link is obviously on our YouTube channel and on the, the blog with the podcast uh, as well. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you. It was my pleasure.